Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this is a very interesting lesson. It's lesson number 10 for March 11, 20, of 2023, entitled Giving Back. Giving Back. Hmm. I wonder what all that includes. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we understand that everything really belongs to you. Without you, there would be none of it. And yet, we sometimes get the idea that we earn something or we, we, it, we, we're owed it. Um, it belongs to us. Someone gives it to us. We need to recognize that no matter where it might come from, it still originally came from you. And we need to recognize our responsibility for returning a reasonable portion to you. May that be more clearly understand, understood as we stu study this lesson as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we, as individuals, are getting up in years, we start to think about what will happen when we retire after we've already retired, and even after we die. However, if we are faithful church members, the real future goes beyond this earth. We need to keep that in mind as we make plans. Our Bible study guide puts it in these words, Jim. As people get older, they almost naturally begin to worry about the future. The most common fears are dying too soon before the family is taken care of, living too long, outliving one's assets or savings, catastrophic illness, all one's resources could do, go at one time, or mental and or uh, physical disability, who will take care of me? From the Bible Study Guide. So I'm sure every one of us has heard someone, maybe even ourselves, think of some of those issues. Are you concerned about any of these problems? Is it appropriate for us to put our trust in God to care for us as He sees fit? Ellen White had some comments. G Gary? From the writings of Ellen G. White, it is frequently the case that aged persons are unwilling to realize and acknowledge that their mental strength is failing. Who wants to admit that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no one here will admit that. <laughs> They shorten their days by taking care which belongs to their children. Satan often plays upon their imagination and leads them to feel a continual anxiety in regard to their money. It is their idol and they hoard it with miserly care. All these fears originate with Satan. Hmm. He excites the organs which lead to slavish fears and jealousies which corrupt nobleness of soul and destroy elevated thoughts and feelings. Such persons are insane upon the subject of money. Oh. If they would take the position which God would have them, their last days might be their best and happiest. Those who have children in whose honesty and judicious management they have re reason to confide should let their children make them happy. Unless they do this, Satan will take advantage of the lack of many, mental rather strength and will manage for them. They should lay aside anxiety and burdens and occupy their time as happily as they can and be ripening up for heaven. That's from Testimonies <laughs> of the Church. Okay. Anybody want to sign up for ripening up for heaven? <laughs> Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 423, 424. Those are written when Ellen and I were still very young. How many of us fit this description? If you are already retired or soon to be, do you see yourself as ripening up for heaven? Or are we going to allow Satan to determine our futures? In 1880, Ellen White spoke some very interesting words regarding the use of our funds, especially after we die. Charles? Mm. Many manifest a needless uh, delicacy on this point. Now we're talking specifically about what's going to happen when you die with the money that you left, leave behind. 
They feel that they are stepping up on forbidden ground when they introduce the subject of uh, property to the aged or to in invalids. Invalids. Yes, in order to learn what disposition they desire, design to make of it. But this duty is just as sacred as the duty to preach the word to save souls. Wow, mm -hmm. look at that. So this must be from the Bible study guide, not from Ellen White, right? No, this is from Ellen White. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Man, it's just as much a duty to speak to the elderly about what they're going to do with their funds after they, as they finish up their life and after they die as it is to preach the word to save souls. Wow. Here's a man with God's money or property in his hands. He's about to change his stewardship. Will he place the means which God has lent him to be used to his cause in the hands of wicked men just because they are for his are his relatives should not christian men feel interested in the and anxious for that man's future good as well as for the interest of god's cause that he shall make a right disposition of his lord's money the talents lent him for wise improvement? Will his brethren stand by and see him losing his hold on his life and at the same time robbing the treasury of God? This would be a fearful loss to himself and to the cause. For by placing his talent of means in the hands of those who have no regard for the truth of God, he would to all in, intents and purposes, be wrapping it in a napkin and hiding it in the earth. Wow. The Lord would have his followers dispense their means while they can to do it themselves. Some inquire, must we actually dispose ourselves of everything which we can, which we call our own? We may not be required to do this now but we must be willing to do so for Christ's sake. Some close their ears and calls made for money to be used in sending missionaries to foreign countries and in publishing the truth and scattering it like autumn leaves all over the world. Such excuse their covetousness by informing you that they have made arrangements to be to, the, to be charitable at death. They have considered the cause of God in their wills. Therefore, they live a little... Live a life. Uh, adver what's this word? Life of avarice. Mm -hmm. Robbing God, tithes and offerings, and in their wills return God but a small portion of that which he had lent them while a very large proportion is appropriated to relatives who have no interest in the truth. This is the worst kind of robbery. Wow. They rob God of his just dues, not only all through their lives, but also at death. Ellen White Testament is to the Church, Volume 4, page 479, paragraph 1 and 2. 1880. 1880. So what kind of counsel can we find from God about how we should prepare? Are we living as if we really believe that everything we ha are and have comes from the Lord? We are just managing for the Master. Think about our series of les lessons here. Do we act like that in our daily transactions and specifically in our contributions to the cause of God? Jesus himself gave us a parable found in Luke 12, 16 to 21, which is the story of the fool who built bigger barns to hold his crops so he could take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy himself. Consider what Jesus said about him, his conclusion. Myra? Luke 12, 21. And Jesus concluded, This is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves but are not rich in God's sight. Okay, there's a good question. What does it mean to be rich in God's sight? 
wouldn't be how much money you have. We are told that we will take our characters to heaven. What attributes of character are you planning to take with you? Should we be thinking about what attributes we're going to take with us? We can also lay up treasure in heaven by paying our tithes and offerings. Are we doing that? I mean, Jesus told him, told us very clearly, lay up treasure in heaven. Right? The rich man described in the parable in Luke 12 may have been an honest, hardworking man. We, we don't know. We have no indication that he was lazy or dishonest. The problem was about how he expected to spend his wealth. But let us remember that none of us know the exact day of our death. Are we prepared? How much planning does one need to do for his, her or his retirement years and future? That depends on one's health and life expectancy. So what factors go into that? How long did your parents live? That's a, that's a clue. Do you have any medical problems that could shorten your life or cause a lot of expenses in the future? That's another clue. Who else is depending on you for support? That's another clue. Have you written a will? Well, that's a, one thing you can do. What church-related commitments do you have or plan to have? So there's several things to think about. Yeah. How long should we continue to be useful in work? Ellen White published some of her best-known works, including the book Desire of Ages, after the age of 70. So long as we are healthy and active, we should continue to serve God. Moses started his major life work at the age of 80 and finished still healthy at the age of 120. By the way, you probably heard that the lady, the oldest living, the oldest, oldest known living person died this week at 118. Mm -hmm. yeah. Daniel and John were probably in their early 90s when they finished their life's work. You may be, may be retired, but there are plenty of volunteer opportunities in the church. So just because you're retired doesn't mean you're done. Well, Matthew 24, 31 to 46 talks about how God distributes funds in, in a sense. This familiar parable teaches that we need to place God's work as a priority in our lives. It concludes how happy that servant is if his master finds him doing this when he comes home. <clears throat> Are we using the money God has given us appropriately? As you look over your own life, what are the most important things in your life? Does, God work, does God's work have a major influence in your life? There are many verses in the scripture suggesting that life is short and saying that just as we were born without anything, we will die without anything. And there's, if you get our handout by going to our website at theox.org, uh, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you will get, you'll see all these uh, things. And some, most of them are, are in the Bible study guide. It is very important to have a will or trust or an estate plan to determine how your earthly possessions will be distributed when you die. Do you have faithful, church-loving, believing relatives who will carry on what you believe is the right thing to be done with your money? If your estate ends up going into the hands of someone who has no concern for the church, is it lost to God's cause? Gordon? In the Bible study guide, in the simplest terms, we can say that because God is the owner of everything, as it says in Psalms 24, 1, it would be logical to conclude from the biblical perspective that when we are finished with what God has entrusted to us, we should return to him, the rightful owner, what is left, once the needs of loved ones are met. Bible study guide for Monday. That's quite a comment, isn't it? And you want to read Psalm 24, 1 for us? The world and all that is in it belong to the Lord. The earth and all who live in it are His. That's a pretty comprehensive statement, isn't it? Well, a number of verses in the Old Testament make it very clear that God recognizes our responsibilities for those who depend upon us, mainly our families. And of course, there's many verses for that, about, for that as well. Have we made adequate provisions for the care of those who will leave behind? We will leave behind. It is very important that we make provisions 
while we are in the best mental and physical health to distribute our goods as God would have us do. Remember that the only treasure that lasts forever is that treasure which is stored in heaven. We can only take our characters and memories with us to heaven. Some comfort themselves with the idea that included in their will is something to be given to God's cause. But look at what the Bible says about that. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Command those who are rich in the things of this life not to be proud, but to place their hope not in such an uncertain thing as riches, but in God, who generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. And 2 Corinthians 4, 18, For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things, but are, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. Proverbs 30, verse 8, Keep me from lying, and let me be neither rich nor poor, so give me only as much food as I need. That's uh, <laughs> quite an interesting <laughs> statement. Give me only as much food as I need so I don't get fat, huh? I guess so, and well, where am I going to get my clothes and my housing and so forth? Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, If you love money, you will, be ne you will never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you will never get all you want. It is useless. And that sounds like the, the usual refrain for Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? Go to the it? previous uh, text, please. Ecclesiastes, you're right. Um, uh, look at Jesus. Homeless, yeah. radical. Homeless, no education. Then look at what has well, happened. So, no, no, no formal education. Okay. Yes. No pharisaical education. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. He obviously could read. He, oh, of course. Yes. In he more than one reading. language. Yes. yes. He read in the uh, Hebrew temple. Right. Twelve years old. Right. If we make good use of our money and use a good share of it to support God's cause, might God bless us? and even give us more to use for his cause? Well, here's the statement that really sort of sums up that thing. Matthew 6, 33. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Hmm. Do, we do we dare to depend upon that statement? Many have ruined their lives and lost their souls in pursuit of money. However, with God's help, we can overcome such problems. The best answer is not just making a provision so that when one dies, a portion is given to the church, but also giving while one is alive. Jim? Well, the Bible study guide. In context of being a good steward in planning or death, one danger that people face is the temptation to hoard assets now justifying that hoarding with the idea that, well, when I die, I can give it all away. Though better than just spending it all now, one billionaire had said that he knew that he would be living right only if he, excuse me, if the check he, for his funeral bounced. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's an interesting one. <laughs> we can and should, do better than that from the Bible study guide. Ellen White says, I saw that many withhold from the cause while they live, require quieting their conscience that they will be charitable at death. They hardly dare exercise faith and trust in God to give anything while living. But this deathbed charity is not what Christ requires of his followers. It cannot excuse the selfish, selfishness of the living. Those who hold fast their property till the last moment surrender it to death rather than to the cause. Losses are con occurring continually. Banks fail and the property it is consumed in very many ways. God, excuse me, many purposes do something, many, many purpose. purpose to do something, but they delay the matter and Satan works to prevent the means from coming to, into the treasury at all. It is lost before it is returned to God, and Satan exults that it is so. Ellen White, Testimony of the Church, Volume 5, page 154. In some parts of the world, 
$100 can support a pastor or a Bible worker and their families for an entire month. Should we consider that when we carelessly spend money on ourselves? Imagine what it will be like to get to heaven and discover many souls there thanking us or thanking you for making it possible for them to learn the truth and end up in heaven because of your donations. Wow. When considering all these issues, it is very important to remember that ultimately everything belongs to God, and we've already read that, Psalm 24, 1. Not only our lives, but also our future salvation depend upon Him. Every breath comes only because of His power. Where are we here? Charles, I guess? No, Carrie. No, Carrie. I think, yes. Hebrews 3, 4. Every house, of course, is built by someone, and God is the one who has built all things. This is from the Good News Bible. Psalm 50.10. All the animals in the forest are mine, and the cattle on thousands of hills. Mm. Good News Bible. It is not logical that when we are finished with our lives, we make uh, provision for our family and then return as much as possible to God. How many of us th think in those terms? Okay, Carl, uh, Charles? In giving to the work of God, you are laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. All that you lay up above is secure from disaster and loss and is increasing to an eternal and enduring substance and will be registered to your account in God's kingdom. Ellen White, Riven Herald, January 24, 1888. There are many advantages to giving what we are while we are alive. Below are some of them as enumerated in the Bible study guide. One, the donor actually can see the results of the gift, a new church building, a young person in college, an evangelistic campaign funded, and so on. And Carrie and I know about uh, an organization that, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing it up. I know about an organization where you can actually fund to, pro to provide translation of the Bible, at least the New Testament, yes. sometimes the whole Bible, into parts of the world, places where they do not yet have a single word of the Bible in their language. Well, China, North Korea, all those places, they don't yeah. get it. They get a bullet on them if they're full with that stuff. Yeah. Well, I heard one time it was told, someone came and represented this in church, a very interesting story. They went to northwestern China, just a little ways from the, from the Korean border, waited until the winds were blowing in the right direction, and sent up a balloon with a little... Um, gadget on a little, a little electronic thing in the bottom with a big load of, of Bible study, Bible verses and stuff, lessons stuff on it. They sent it off, and when it was set so that they knew it was way over uh, North Korean territory, they pushed the button and the thing just <laughs> blew all these little pamphlets down in the, you know, very Hopefully It wasn't in just forest or the mountains. No, they had, they had some way of knowing pretty much where it was. Okay, so these are ways, there are many ways in which we can donate and really make an impact. Number two, the ministry or person can benefit now when the need is greatest. And this is the time when it's needed. Three, there is no fighting among family or friends after your death. And that's a very sad story, but happens sometimes. Four, it sets a good example of family values of generosity and love for others. Five, it minimizes the state tax consequence. You want to talk about that, Jim? <laughs> no, I mean, it's not fair to... I mean, obviously the government would love to have as much of your money as they possibly can get their hands on. Well, that's one thing the church does for, at least conferences do, they make living trusts for people. Uh -huh. but, uh... Six, it guarantees that the gift will be made to your desired entity, no interference from the courts or disgruntled relatives. 
I mean, just think of how many wonderful opportunities there is to, to donate money that seems to have very definite positive effects. Seven, it demonstrates that the heart of the donor has been changed from selfish to unselfish. And eight, it stores up treasure in heaven. And when you talked about number seven, changing the heart from selfish to unselfish, that would be getting rid of covetousness, right? From our last lesson, from last week. 28, in light of all that, notice these words from Ellen White. Charles, I think that's yours. That's me. 27, okay. Ellen White, that which many purpose to differ until they're about to die. If they were Christians, indeed, they would do while they have a strong hold on life. They would devote themselves and their property to God. And while acting as his stewards, they would have the satisfaction of doing their duty. By becoming their own executors, they could meet not, the... Not execute, executors. 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 That's <laughs> they would meet the claims of God themselves instead of shifting their responsibility upon others. This is Ellen White, Testimonies for Church, Volume 4, page 480. So, now we can come back to Jim again with some legal experience. What does it mean to be your own executor? You're the one that... Makes the decisions. Makes the decision pertaining to the property. Okay. The assets. That means to make clear, firm decisions about the distribution of your goods, preferably while you're still alive so you can see the results. So this was happening when Ellen White was alive and the church was rather young. Very young. Yeah. Yes. And they were supposed to have been on zeal and fervency. And they were, well, so. many of them, were. but not everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know that the reason our church was first organized into a group was because pastors who were going out, starting churches and so forth, and building church buildings, and then those pastors were saying, oh, this church building is mine. It doesn't, it's in my name. It's now mine. And I'm the, rich. Yeah. And the, and the conference, I mean, the people got together, Ellen White and James White and so forth, said, you know, we, we have to have some kind of an organization that owns these properties so that people won't take them. Just claim that they're theirs. Anyway, to be your own executor means to make clear, firm decisions about the distribution of your goods, preferably while you're still alive so you can see the results. There are, of course, many calls for funds in many directions. We must be very wise in determining how we give our money. There are those who set dates for the second coming and ask us to give our funds to them so that they can be prepared and prepare others. Setting dates is not God's plan at this point in history. There was Mr. Brother Kemping, remember that? Yeah, the guy put around Fresno, yeah. family radio. He was going all over the world. We must be very wise as we decide where we will place our money. Is it reasonable for faithful Christians to return a significant portion of their retirement funds to God with the hope that he will care for them? How do you understand the following passages? Matthew 6:34. So do not worry about tomorrow. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I, I, I added 633 here because I thought it was appropriate. Let me read 33 okay. and then you can read okay. 34. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you. And he will provide you with all these other things. Okay. And then, so, do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add troubles each day, add to the troubles each day brings. I think sure. that's a much better answer by adding verse 33 to the, yes. the question they ask. Yes. And then Psalm 71, 18. Now that I'm old and my hair is gray, do not abandon me, O God. Be with me while I proclaim your power and might to all generations to come. Good News Bible. You were the wrong one to read that. Any yeah, of the rest my, of us could. my hair yeah. is gray. It's just hidden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if we should pass before Jesus comes again, we will have no way of seeing exactly what happens with our assets. 
So how large should our future planning be? Are we thinking about a future in heaven? Clearly, everything belongs to God. Without his creative power, we could do nothing. We've already read Psalm 24, 1. So, the, Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, our life and riches do not last forever. Our possessions will be passed on to others, and we, will, and we cannot take anything with us beyond this life. And the references for each of these. So whenever possible, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Doesn't say to the children, but to the children's <laughs> children, to the grandchildren. However, he must do it in such a way as to prevent disputes among them. In drawing up a will, he must not think of his own earthly interests only and fail to be generous toward God. This failure was the ruin of the foolish rich man in Jesus' parable that we read earlier, or re yeah. that we referenced earlier in Luke 12. That's from the Adult Bible Study Guide. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Some verses to support those ideas. Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. That's pretty comprehensive, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 4, 18. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. So whether we, had a, whether we have a lot of this world's goods or only a little, it all belongs to God. Do we take that into consideration when we make our use of our funds? Well, here's an interesting verse that uh, has some interesting implications. Jim? Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. Feasting makes you happy and wine cheers you up. But you can't have either without money. <laughs> and there's uh, now, is that true because it's in the Bible, or is it in the Bible be because it's true? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the way life works. Well, I, I mean, in, in 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 Bible times, when David was writing, I, I, this would be Solomon. When Solomon was writing, there was almost no means of exchange. I mean, there was no regular currency, certainly no paper currency, anything like this. Those things weren't invented to mint the hundreds of years later. So, you know, having animals or having orchards that would put, or vineyards that would produce grapes and so forth, that was, that was wealth. But in our day, I mean, you can have a whole lifetime's worth of, worth of profits almost in one little piece of paper um, represented somehow or other. Well, it's so easy to grasp for money because we realize how it, having it allows us to do many things. But we need to remember 1 Timothy 6.10 6, 6, 6, six, For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. Oh dear. Well, do you look forward to death with fear? Now here's an interesting verse. I wonder what you think the context is here. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Jim, you want to read that for us? Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death. And in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. That's a, that's a text that I've been <laughs> marked down in my Bible years and years ago. It's so, <laughs> imagine it's Satan in fear of death his, how many ages has he, from our point of view, yeah. has he had to live in that uh, mindset? Yeah, okay. Well, what does it mean to be a slave because you fear death? And Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, there's another verse that goes with it. Do you want to read that one? Hebrews 2, excuse me, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. 
I will never abandon you. So this is really the crux of what we're talking about here in this lesson. How much do we need to say, do I have enough money to take care of myself? Do I, am I going to be all right if I have this much, if I do this, if I do this and this? Do we dare to say, okay, I'll, I'll do my best, but I'm depending upon the Lord to take care of me? Is that? Well, that's what the Lord's prayer is, isn't it? Yeah. Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that foolish to say? Not a whole storehouse of it, because <laughs> I think Alan White made some reference. If you, well, you got th thieves do a break in and steal, and mm -hmm. she said make some reference that don't store up a lot of food, and yeah. uh, because if somebody's going to find out, <laughs> they're going to want to take it away from you. So, yeah. Well, um, as we read earlier, you know, if you're a real Christian, you doesn't matter. You have you. You're wealthy. What are we because doing all this stuff for? Isn't it we're looking for for to eternal life? Well, that's the, that's the, the, the ultimate goal. Yeah. So he told us very simply in John mm -hmm. seventeen. Yeah. And is and and the Philippians what two five? Let this mind be in you. And you said earlier about being like Jesus. Yeah. Learn to think like him, mm -hmm. and then you will be healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's. It's, I mean, obviously many of the challenges that uh, we've studied in these lessons are partially at least, or maybe completely resolved if we recognize that God didn't plan for us to live for just a few years. Now he planned for us to live forever. Are we living with that ultimate goal clearly in mind? Refer to the angels that, that were be, the ones we call angels that were before the creation of this earth mm -hmm. that have never died. Mm -hmm. Yet you find out in uh, Psalms 82, 6 and 7, and Jeremiah 10, 11, you're going to die. Talking to them, mm -hmm. you're going to die like men. Yeah. Well, Jude says that they're being stored, the evil angels, mm -hmm. the ones who rebelled, are being stored up until the the day comes for them to be to be destroyed. So when Satan says you're not going to die, no intelligent creature had ever seen death, and we, only records we have is that's within the last about three thousand years, somewhere in that, or thirty five hundred years, three thousand years probably less, that uh, talking to the angels. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, God planned for us to do work. He didn't plan for us to just sit around on our tush. Try to imagine what beautiful and wonderful things Adam and Eve were given to do. I, you know, every once in a while I stop and think, okay, what did the Garden of Eden look like? Yeah. And, I mean, did, did God create the trees already with a fruit ready to be picked and eaten? Apparently so. They had to eat something, and they didn't eat vegetables. Some we know of, that. Certainly some of them had to be uh, ripe and ready to eat, or yeah. they wouldn't have eaten for a while. Meals ready to eat, MRE. Yeah. <laughs> called, <laughs> called a tree-ripened fruit. Yeah. yeah. There were seeds in it. And what, what, and what did they have to do? Did they, trim, did they trim the vineyards? Did they prune the trees? What, what did they do? I mean... The, it, these, there was nothing dying in those days. I mean, this is a challenge when we get to heaven. If we pick a flower and it never fades, are you finally going to stick it in the ground somewhere and it's going to grow there? Yeah. I was going to have no work to do there. <laughs> oh, yes, there'll be work to do. <laughs> well, but then sin entered our planet and things changed. We were forced to do hard work to get the ground to produce enough to feed ourselves and our families. But none of us should be surprised as we realize that as we get older, we become weaker. We may ask God not to abandon us, and he will not. But despite our physical decline, we could still bear fruit for God. Psalms 92:14, for example, says, that you stare bear, bear, bear fruit in old age and are always green and strong. Well, God promises to care for us in our old age. Isaiah 46, 4, we must never forget. 
And Ecclesiastes 5.15, let's see, Carrie, is this you? Yes. We leave this world just as we entered it, with nothing. In spite of all our work, there is nothing we can take with us. From the yep. Good News Bible. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10, Honor the Lord by making him an offering from the best of all that your land produces. If, if you do, your barns will be filled with grain and you will have too much wine to be able to store it all. Good news, Bible. Now, are you all got your, your, your barns full of grain and your, uh, your wine cellar is so full that you don't, you don't have room for them all? All of it? Nope. Nope. So what are we going to conclude from this? I mean, obviously, this is talking, he was talking to a very agrarian society, and these are the things that, uh, that they did, and the things they stored and whatever. I don't know exactly how they stored their wine. Um, that's a good question. But uh, what would be the equivalent today? Of wine? Having your portfolio fully bested. And, and maybe having a pantry that's full of nice yes. fruit that you canned and so forth like that. That would be appropriate, wouldn't it? Yeah. Look at some of the promises that God made to his faithful followers down through the Old Testament and the New Testament. In this divine will are included material blessings, such as the land of Canaan, Genesis. So let's look at that really quick here. Then and there the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He said, I promise to give, you, give your descendants all this land from the border of Egypt to the river Euphrates. How large an area is that? Almost the entire Middle East, right? It's tremendous. This is going to be your land. Okay, what else? Becoming a great nation. Okay, let's look what else it says. Genesis 12, 2. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. And Genesis 15, 5. The Lord took him out and said, look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. In that fact, was Abraham, right? Yeah. That was Abraham. In fact, a lot yeah. more than that. How many stars does the naked eye able to see? You know? No, no. Okay. How do you count? <laughs> yeah. About 4,000. Yeah. About 4,000. So obviously, it's way, of course, it's, you know, with this new telescope that they just put up not too long ago, they did, well, they did this with the Hubble when it first went up as well. Yeah. They, they focused it on a spot where they thought there was nothing. <laughs> with this new telescope, you know, after all that Hubble stuff that they have found, this new telescope, they poked us out there, and same story, an empty spot, there's galaxies, and there's worlds, and there's whatever out there. Nobody has any idea how many there are all together. Okay, and? An abundant material possessions, Deuteronomy 28, 11. Okay, and that says, the Lord will give you many children, many cattle, and abundant crops, and the land he promised ancestors to give you, ancestors to give you. Is that apply to us? Yes. God still planning to do that for Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are faithful? Yeah. Oh, well. It happens. Well, you just came back and you had a beautiful report. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the church in Tanzania where we visited recently is growing like wildfire. That's beautiful. There are also Zero. spiritual promises. The Messiah, Galatians 3.16. Uh, now, God made his promises to Abraham and to his descendant. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning only one person only, namely Christ. Christ. So that was the promise to the children of Israel, that the Messiah would come from among them. And the go ahead, and the commission. And the commission to take these blessings to all nations, Genesis 12, 3. Okay. Let's just look at that one. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and th through you I will bless all the nations. And Galatians 3, 8. 
the scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scriptures announced the good news to, uh, to Abraham, though your God, uh, through you God will bless the whole human race. And then verse 14, Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Christ Jesus, so that through faith we might receive the spirit promised by God. So there's, I mean, lots and lots and lots of promises to Abraham and his descendants. Okay. All who live by faith are beneficiaries of this will, receive this commission, and need no fear because they are under God's care. Okay, do we believe that? Well, the questions come, are we fulfilling this commission? Are we spreading the gospel to the whole world? Do these promises still apply to Christians? Or were they just for the Hebrews in the Old Testament? Of course, we do not expect to inherit property in the Middle East. I don't expect that ever to happen to me. Well, the Old Testament promises were primarily addressed to the children of Israel. We know that Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Let me just read that. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So do Abraham's promises apply to us? Sounds like it. Paul certainly, Paul certainly thought so, didn't he? Yeah. They make it clear, these promises, that all those who follow Christ are regarded as Abraham's descendants. Look at these promises uh, made to Abraham. Genesis 18, 17 to 19. And the Lord said to himself, I will not hide from Abraham what I am going to do. His descendants will, will be will become a great and mighty nation, and through him I will bless all nations. I have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to do what is right and just. If they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. And what about David's prayers to God? First Chronicles 29, 2 and 3, Gordon. I have made every effort to prepare materials for the temple, gold, silver, bronze, iron, timber, precious stones and gems, stones for mosaics and quantities of marble. Over and above all this that I have provided, I have given silver and gold from my personal property because of my love for God's temple. Let me interrupt for just a second. Where did he put all that stuff? It must have been preserved somewhere. I mean, you couldn't just leave all that stuff. I mean, there's a huge, if you read the story there, there's an enormous amount of wealth. Yeah. I bet it was kept in his palace somewhere. Probably, yeah. somehow. Okay. Second Chronicles 3, 1 to 2. King David, Solomon's father, had already, already prepared a place for the temple. It was in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared to David, the place where Arana, the is that how it said? Arana, Arana. Arana, the Jebusite had used as a threshing place. King Solomon began the construction in the second month of the fourth year that he was king. And then Second Chronicles 6, 32 and 33, when foreigners who live in a distant land hear how great and powerful you are and how you are always ready to act, and then they come to pray at this temple, listen to their prayers. This is talking to God. Yeah, this is, this is Solomon's prayer. In heaven where you live, hear them and do what they ask you to do, so that all the peoples of the world may know you and obey you as, you, as your people Israel do. Boy, if they only did. Yeah. <laughs> then they will know that this temple I have built is where you are to be worshipped. I, if you read what Ellen White says about that dedication, it's amazing. Uh, Solomon built a platform. I mean, think about, you know, th this was a situation where the, the, the local tribes were there were fighting with each other. I mean, these kings were at each other all the time. But Solomon had become such a, 
such an, a force in that whole area that he literally invited many of these foreign kings and so forth to come to Jerusalem and he built a platform and he up on that platform instead of saying look to me and you know like all these other kings would have said look to me and who great I am he knelt down mm -hmm. and prayed to God on that platform in front of all those people I mean what a what a revelation to those people I mean they must have gone home thinking yeah you know what a what a different a different attitude a different approach what voice projection he must have had to yeah. yes. without microphones and speakers yeah. and so on to uh, let people hear him yeah David made the provisions for the building of the temple Solomon of course did the work but it was intended to be a house of prayer for the people of all nations mm -hmm. and he said that you, you you're not just here to but people are supposed your people send them here you can praise God here we, we won't you know we're not going to fight with you let them come here and worship God here David recognized that everything they gave to be used for the building of the temple was really only what God had given them already first Chronicles 29 14 yet my people and I cannot really give you anything because everything is a gift from you and we have only given back what is real yours already and that helps us to understand the title for this lesson giving back with all this in mind it is clear that God intends for our material possessions to be used for the promotion of the gospel during our lives and during the lives of those to whom we will our means <clears throat> there are numerous examples in the Bible when great revivals took place then people brought money to the sanctuary or temple in, or in the New Testament to the Apostles this was recorded in the Old Testament and there's a number of references when when true honest revivals happened people just swarmed in and gave money and so forth uh, and just one example is, is Acts 4 34 through 37 Jim there was no one in the group who was in need those who owned fields and or houses would sell them bring the money received from the sale and handed over to the apostles and the money was distributed to each according to his need and so it was that Joseph a Levite born in Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas that is which excuse me which means one who encourages sold a field he owned brought the money and handed over to the apostles from the good this people. is this is not an Ananias and Sapphira no. <laughs> What would happen if all church members were faithful in the giving of their tithes and offerings and the sharing of their wealth with the cause of God? Carrie? This is from uh, Mrs. White. This is as true in temporal as in spiritual things. The Lord does not come to this world with gold and silver to advance his work. He supplies men with resources that by their gifts and offerings they may keep his work advancing. And one purpose above all others for which God's gifts should be used is the sustaining of workers in the great harvest field. And if men and women as well will become channels of blessing to other souls, the Lord will keep the channels supplied. It is not returning to God his own that makes men poor. It is withholding that tends to poverty. The work of imparting that which he has received will constitute every member of the church a labor together with God. Of yourself you can do nothing, but Christ is the great worker. It is the privilege of every human being <coughs> who receives Christ to be a worker together with him. The Savior said, I, if I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men unto me. All. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. yes. Men shouldn't be in there. John 12, 32. For the joy of seeing souls redeemed, Christ endured the cross. He became the living sacrifice for a fallen world. Into that act of self-sacrifice was put the heart of Christ, the love of God, and through this sacrifice was given to the world the mighty influence of the Holy Spirit. It is through sacrifice that God's work must be carried forward. Now notice his next paragraph very carefully. 
a flood of light is shining from the Word of God and there must be an awakening to neglected opportunities. When all are faithful in giving back to God his own in tithes and offerings, the way will be open for the world to hear the message for this time. If the hearts of God's people were filled with love for Christ, if every church member were thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-sacrifice, if all manifested thorough earnestness, there would be no lack of funds for home or foreign missions. Our resources would be multiplied. A thousand doors of usefulness would be opened and we should be invited to enter. Enter, rather. Have the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving to the world messages of mercy Christ would ere this have come to the earth and the saints would have received their welcome into the city of God. Wow. Amazing. If there was ever a time when sacrifices should be made, it is now. Those who have money should understand that now is the time to use it for God. Let not means be absorbed into multiplying facilities where the work is already established. Do not add building to building where many interests are now centered. Use the means to establish centers in new fields. Thus you may bring in souls who will act their part in producing. Okay, just uh, read the part in bold there. Instead of adding to facilities already abundant, build up the work in these destitute fields. Again and again the Lord has spoken in regard to this. His blessing cannot attend his people in disregarding his instructions. Oh. That's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6. Yeah, that was written about 1901. So the Lord designs that the death of his servant shall be regarded as a loss because of the loss of their influence for good, which they exerted in the many willing offerings they bestow to replenish the treasury of God. So how often are we following this instruction? I'll let you answer that question. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've had some challenging things to think about from Scripture and from Ellen White in this lesson. Some things that we can see are not being followed very carefully. And then Ellen White tells us that if we had followed these rulings way back in the 1880s, Jesus would have come before now. Lord, forgive us for delaying your coming. May we do our part today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.